Welcome to the Lower Digestive System. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, the Histology Wizard. In today's tutorial, we'll continue down the digestive tract, focusing on the relevant histological features and functions of the small intestine. The primary function of the small intestine is to complete the digestive processes initiated in the mouth and then continued in the stomach. And in addition, the small intestine is the site where most of the digested food is absorbed. In short, enzymes produced in the intestinal mucosa and the pancreas, along with emulsifying, bol along with emulsifying bile produced in the liver, enable the uptake of protein carbohydrates and lipid components. You'll recall that the wall of the small intestine, like most of the digestive tube, has the same four major layers. The mucosa with the epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis mucosa, the submucosa, muscularis externa, and serosa, or visceral peritoneum. But some of these layers look very different in the small intestine. So we'll start with the mucosa, which is highly specialized for absorption and digestion. How exactly does the small intestine absorb 90% of the products of digestion? Well, the small intestine is about seven meters long. That's approximately two thirds the length of a garden hose. And it's about an inch in diameter. So that's actually a lot of surface area for absorption. But the wall of a hose is pretty flat and as water flows through, it's also pretty straight. So there really isn't a lot of time for absorption along the way. Now, unlike a hose, the small intestine has some interesting special features that serve to increase the surface area for absorption. And in fact, there are three key features. First, we have the plica circulare, next the villi, and finally microvilli on the apical surface of the intestinal epithelial cells or enterocytes. And we can compare these features to the simple tubular glands of the colon. The plica are going to increase the surface area about threefold, the villi about tenfold, and the microvilli about twentyfold. And altogether, these modifications make the total surface area about 200 meters squared, or roughly the size of a tennis court. So that's a lot of surface area. Now we'll take a more detailed look at each of these specializations. Here's one way to visualize these specifications. First, we have the plica circularis, and these are actual folds in the submucosa and mucosa, and I like to think of them as mountains. Here's an H&E stain section through the jejunum, the middle portion of the small intestine, and these plica circularis are permanent folds, folds of mucosa and submucosa, and unlike the folds or rugae in the stomach, these don't distend with digestion and they can't be flattened, and you've probably seen these in the cadaver lab. They appear in the duodenum, but they're most prominent in the jejunum. And on this image, you can now also see some of the finger-like projections off of the mucosa. And these are the villi, and they cover the entire surface of the small intestine. So I think of them as ant hills jutting off of those mountains. Now let's take a closer look at the villi. The villi are mucosal outgrowths that internally contain a cellular lamina propria that has a capillary network and lymphatics, which we'll discuss in a minute. Externally, they're covered in simple columnar epithelium, and they have microvilli at their apical ends, and we'll get to those in a minute. But first, let's look at those villi in section. Here you can see an EM showing those finger-like projections, and two different cross-sections showing villi with their internal lamina propria. And you can see that they may look quite different depending upon the plane of section. Now what happens if those villi are destroyed? If you guessed a decrease in the absorption ability of the small intestine, you'd be correct. Normally, villi will absorb the end products of digestion into the blood or the lacteals, which are the lymphatics and the lamina propria. And in celiac disease, these villi are lost or destroyed, which greatly decreases the absorption. Now here are two H&E stain sections of small intestine, and you can note the blunted villi in the mucosa of the celiac patient. So you might take a minute here and try to predict some of the symptoms of celiac disease. The last specializations we'll talk about are the microvilli, the apical specializations on the enterocytes, the simple columnar cells of the villi. So I think about these cells as Bart Simpson's head, and I think about the microvilli as Bart Simpson's hair. But what exactly are microvilli? Well, these are hair-like structures that line the apical surfaces of cells. They're made of actin filaments, and they're essentially folds of the membrane, and they form the brush border of epithelial cells in the intestine and in the kidney, and they function in absorption. 
Let's contrast the microvilli to the cilia. Remember, cilia are found in the respiratory tract, but they're also found in the uterine tube in the inner ear. They're composed of microtubules, and they move in a sweeping fashion, causing those waves of movement to move particles or cells. Remember the mucociliary escalator. So I think of microvilli like a brush with very stiff bristles, while cilia are longer and look more like eyelashes. And sometimes you'll even see those eyelashes clumping together. And again, cilia move, while microvilli do not. So now we'll take a look at the intestinal mucosa and discuss the different cell types that are found in the epithelium. And as we go along, we'll have a quick overview of digestion. So you may remember way back when we first learned about the different epithelial cell types, that simple columnar epithelium is found in the intestines. So here we see a cartoon showing the different types of cells found in the epithelium and their general locations. First, outlined in green on this h &E stained image, we have the enterocytes. These are our absorptive columnar cells, and they do the bulk of digestion. You can also see the microvilli, or the brush border on each enterocyte, and together they make up Bart Simpson's head. In blue, we see goblet cells. These are cells we've seen before in the stomach and the respiratory system. There are also panath, enteroendocrine, and stem cells, and these cells are mostly found in the intestinal crypts. And we'll discuss those crypts and those cell types in just a minute. First, here are a couple of other examples. In all three of these images, you can see the enterocytes with their brush borders. In the EM image, one of those cells is outlined in green. And each of these contains roughly 3,000 microvilli at its apical end. In contrast, in the images on the left, you can see the goblet cells marked with the yellow arrows. Remember, these produce mucins and form mucus for protection. And finally, we can see an enteroendocrine cell outlined here in red with its very characteristic basal secretory granules. Okay, let's dig a little bit deeper into the digestive functions associated with these cells. And again, we'll start with the enterocyte. So these cells have the basic characteristics of an epithelial layer. They're joined together by tight junctions. Uptake of nutrients and oxygen and removal of cellular waste products occurs at that basal lateral surface. And water and ion transport can occur transcellularly or paracellularly. Absorption is mainly driven by active sodium absorption through the ENAC channel in the apical membrane and that sodium potassium ATPase in the basal lateral membrane. Recall that's going to create an electrochemical driving force for passive chloride transport and water will then follow. Now most of the absorption is actually complete before the ileum, the most distal region of the small intestine. Secretion is driven mostly by the chloride secretion through the CFTR channel and other chloride channels in the apical membrane. And there are anion exchangers and other channels in the basolateral membrane that help chloride accumulate in the cell. And that active chloride accumulation is the driving force for sodium movement paracellularly. All right, what actually is the role of enterocytes in digestion? So if we recall, even after chemical digestion has begun in the mouth and stomach, food is really unrecognizable, but it's still not able to be absorbed. So further chemical digestion and absorption of nutrients are going to take place in the small intestine, and enterocytes are the major players in these processes. So we'll talk about digestion of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, focusing on the role of the enterocyte. And we'll start with carbohydrates. Monosaccharides such as glucose, fructose, and galactose can be absorbed by enterocytes without much further ado. But more complex carbohydrates such as disaccharides, sucrose, lactose, glycogen, and starch also need more work. So you'll remember that salivary amylase has already begun to break down the starches into oligosaccharides, but it is actually inactivated by stomach acid. So now pancreatic amylase will break down the starch that escapes that salivary amylase. And then enzymes within the brush border of the enterocyte, so these are oligo and disaccharidases, will further break down the carbohydrates into monosaccharides. And these include maltase, sucrase, and lactase. Once these are broken down, the monosaccharides are absorbed either via co-transport with sodium or through facilitated diffusion, and then they will leave the epithelial cells 
via facilitated diffusion across that basolateral membrane right into the capillary blood and eventually go to the liver via the portal vein. Proteins digested in the GI tract include the dietary proteins, enzyme proteins from the intestines, and proteins from sloughing off of mucosal cells. Now recall that protein digestion began in the stomach with pepsinogen from chief cells being converted to pepsin. But that pepsin is inactivated in the higher pH of the duodenum. So now those protein fragments from the stomach are greeted by a host of proteolytic enzymes. Trypsinogen and chymotrypsin are going to enter the duodenum from the pancreas. They're converted by enteropeptidase to trypsin and chymotrypsin. And then these cleave the protein fragments into smaller fragments, which are then chopped into amino acids by aminopeptidases. And these are our brush border enzymes. The amino acids are going to enter the enterocyte via symporter channels, and then all amino acids leave the villus epithelial cells by facilitated diffusion across that basolateral membrane. And again, they'll be transported, transported to the liver via the portal vein. Now, the digestion and absorption of lipids requires bile salts from the liver and pancreatic enzymes. And because they're insoluble in water, lipids first have to be emulsified by those bile salts from the liver. They form an aqueous suspension of fatty droplets. Now this doesn't really change the fat molecules, but it helps expose them to more of the pancreatic lipase, which will now catalyze the breakdown of fatty acids. And they're going to bring fat-soluble vitamins along for the ride. The bile salts will now associate with those fatty acids and lecithin into micelles. And those micelles will have fatty acids, cholesterol, and the vitamins sort of nestled in this hydrophilic core. And the micelles are going to diffuse through the microvilli and then the lipids will diffuse out through the plasma membrane. And generally, fat absorption is completed in the ileum. Now inside the cell, the fatty acids and monoglycerides are going to be resynthesized into triglycerides. Then those will combine with other lipids and proteins to form chylomicrons. Now these milky white chylomicrons are large, and they're too large to, pla and they're too large to pass through the plasma membrane or the basement membrane. So they're going to be extruded by exocytosis, and they're going to enter those lacteals, those lymphatic capillaries in the lamina propria, where they'll travel via, travel via the lymph to the thoracic duct and then empty into the venous blood. And in the venous blood, the triglycerides will now be hydrolyzed to free fatty acids by lipoprotein lipase. And now, after all those steps, they can be used or stored. There are a lot of steps that we just went over and a lot of potential causes of malabsorption. So pause for a couple of minutes to try and list some of these causes. Now so far we focused on the major cells found in the villi, but there are also so-called intestinal crypts. These are simple tubular glands that are formed by the invaginations of the mucosa between the villi, and they also increase the surface area. These glands are primarily called the crypts of Lieberkuhn or intestinal crypts, and they contain a number of different cells and a lot of enteroendocrine cells. There are panath cells and stem cells that are found at the base of these crypts. The red staining cells that you can see here at the bottom of the crypts are panath cells. And panath cells are remarkable cells. They're considered the innate immune cells of the intestine. They regulate the microenvironment and they're bacteriostatic, so they release lysozyme and defensins apically into the lumen. The GI tract also has the largest number of endocrine cells. It's called the diffuse neuroendocrine system. Now, as in the stomach, these hormones are going to be released basally from these cells. They control many functions of the GI system, and some of these cells are shown here in this H&E stain section. The cartoon here summarizes the locations of the major cell types and also shows that absorptive goblet and panath cells secrete into the lumen while those enteroendocrine cells secrete basally into blood. Now, when we talked about pancreas and liver, we talked about the duodenum secreting several important hormones that control digestion, secretin and cholecystokinin, or CCK, along with a few others. Secretin and CCK are the two most important to remember. Now, the cartoon and EM here on the left both illustrate the locations and mechanism of the cells that produce the digestive hormones. That was a lot of information about the complicated functions of this very simple columnar epithelium. Now we'll just take a few minutes to talk about the other layers of the small intestine. Like all the other gut regions, the mucosa contains a highly cellular loose connective tissue layer called the lamina propria. 
And this is one location where you really can appreciate the loose nature of loose connective tissue. And in the case of the small intestine, the lamina propria is critical for digestive function. You'll remember from way back that the epithelium is avascular, so the lamina propria actually has a specialized vascular network that supplies those tips of the villi and the upper crypts. And this network originates from the submucosa, as does another plexus that supplies the lower half of the crypts, shown here with the arrow. We also have a single blind lymphatic vessel, that's the lacteal I've been referring to, and it's present in the core of the lamina propria of the villus. Also in the intestinal villus are extensions of smooth muscle, and these are actually part of the muscularis mucosa, which can also be seen here in these sections. Recall that this is smooth muscle that helps the villi and plica circularis move, and so this helps aid in extruding contents of cells into the lumen, which of course aids in digestion. Now as mentioned, the submucosa will contain blood vessels and nerve plexi. The important submucosal plexus is called the Meissner's plexus. And the muscularis externa has the typical inner circular layer and outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscle. And these again are responsible for segmentation and peristalsis movements. And here we also find the myenteric plexus or Albrecht's plexus the primary driver of intestinal motility. Now that I've covered the layers of the small intestine and the roles of the five major cell types in digestion, how do histologists go about telling the three regions, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, apart from one another? Well, for histologists, we've actually boiled it down to one major characteristic per region. The duodenum contains Brunner's glands. These secrete an alkaline substance that helps neutralize the lumen and it protects the surface of the small intestine. These glands used to be thought to produce bicarbonate, but it's really known now that the enterocytes produce the small amounts of intestinal bicarb, but most of it comes from the pancreas. Note also that cholecystokinin and secretin are secreted from enteroendocrine cells in the duodenum. Now you've noticed in Gross Anatomy Lab that the small intestine contains those folds, those plica circularis, those permanent circular folds, and they're in the duodenum to some extent but they're most prominent in the jejunum. So that's our characteristic for this region. And finally, we see in the ileum, shorter villi, no plica circularis, and the presence of highly organized lymphatic tissue, the Peyer's patch. All of the intestines are going to contain lymphatic tissue, but only in the ileum do we see it this highly organized. Critical functions of the ileum include the absorption of vitamin B12 and bile salts. All right, so pretty straightforward. Three regions, three characteristics. Finally, I'd just like to briefly discuss the presence of specialized cells that overlie those pyre patches. These are called M cells or microfold cells. These cells are critical for immune functions and they're considered part of the mucosal associated lymphatic tissue or MALT. And their function is to endocytose antigens and bring them to antigen presenting cells and lymphocytes. And that's important for activating antibody production. Now this slide provides a summary of the major functions of the small intestine, including regional differences in absorption, roles of the different digestive enzymes, roles of the stem cells and their function, and a little bit about the enteric nerve plexi. This last slide, this last slide summarizes the digestive process from the mouth all the way to the anus. And with this, we've reached the end of the small intestine. Be sure to check out the rest of the tutorials on the digestive system. And if you prefer to go in order, you should check out the tutorial on large intestine next. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Thanks for stopping by.